Thanks be to God. In many translations, Mark 10, 9 reads, when what God has joined together, let no one tear asunder. Today I'll be digging in more closely with the word asunder as we step into this passage. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. What God has joined, let no one tear asunder. The asundering. To be asundered means literally to be torn in two. And divorce is a form of asundering. The word divorce itself comes from an old English battle term meaning the severing of a limb. The severing of a limb. When we are torn in two, we feel the effects. We feel it in our broken hearts. We feel it in the severing of one relationship which causes damage to other relationships. For the asundered, the pain of divorce is often so palpable, it feels like the losing of an arm or a leg, or worse, like a dying of sorts. For others, the asundering experience in divorce can bring surprising peace. No more fighting, no more daily difficult struggles and interactions, no more pain in those interactions, or no more pain from the complete failure to interact with one another. To turn away from this text today is to deny the asundering in marriage. It happens. In 2024, statistics tell us that 42% of all first-time marriages end in divorce, 60% of all second-time marriages end in divorce, and 75% of all third-time marriages end in divorce. So if you're a gambler, I wouldn't get married the third time. In addition, 40% of all new marriages have one of the two partners coming from a previous marriage. So this is an interesting statistic there. I also discovered, I read a lot this week about this, I discovered that among religious people, the lowest rate of divorce is among Hindus. And the highest rate of divorce is among evangelical Protestants. <laughs> Thank you, choir. <laughs> Statistics aside, we know that when two are torn in two, everyone else is affected in some way too. In other words, there are beloved asundered ones everywhere hurt by divorce, many who never even hear the real reasons it happened. Couples, children, and extended family all feel the effects of being torn asunder. Just as Jesus has a lot to say about divorce in Mark 10, it will not surprise you that the Bible has a lot to say about divorce too. Remember a couple weeks ago I was preaching about homosexuality. The Bible's not interested in that, but it is interested in this. So this is really different. Quite frankly, most of it is hard to hear. From Genesis 2, as God creates Eve for Adam, running throughout the scriptures, our God who creates us to come together clearly has no idea what to do when people are separated and divorced. God is lost in this. That's my feeling. In fact, in the eyes of God, the separation and divorce of couples is viewed as inconceivable as well as unacceptable. So this theme runs throughout the biblical text, along with counter themes that keep coming into relationships, themes of trauma and infidelity and abuse that keep crashing into this story. And cases for divorce can be made in those situations. This cross current sets up a deep and important question about the sanctity and sacredness of marriage, but it also sets up the effects of trauma inside of marriage and human relationships in general. Divorce arrives in the Levitical and Deuteronomic law codes very early. Later, at least four prophets, Malachi, Jeremiah, Hosea, and Isaiah, all weigh in, and we find that Jesus and Paul 
don't lighten the load in the New Testament, as is pointed out today in Mark. So, for those who have encountered divorce in your lives or in your family life, everybody has an opinion. That's my take on this. Everybody has to put in their two cents in the Bible. Everybody is an expert, right? Does that sound like your experience as well? Everybody feels they have to give you their two cents because what would you do without it? I'd be fine. Like other parts of our life stories, which scripture informs and sometimes crashes into in the ways that we're living, we must find ways to extol what God has given us, which is love. Love in marriage, love in divorce, and love beyond marriage. After all, marriage was made for humans, not humans for marriage. So when marriages fail to enhance and further the total well-being of a human involved or two humans, it causes intense hurt and constant pain, and it either has to change or end. Sadly, the torn asundering that happens in marriage informs the decisions of divorce, and those experiences are never addressed in scripture and almost never addressed by the church. And I have to tell you, and it's gonna be recorded for all time, the church sucks at dealing with divorce. Sorry for my word, but the only word I can come up with. We stink at this. The church has failed so many of you in so many ways because we don't know what to do with God's not knowing what to do. And so we mess up lives by things that we bring to you in all that you're already going through. We need to acknowledge that the continuance of legal marital bonds are not always good if the nurture, happiness, and design of God's plan for you to be fully human is lost in that relationship. Admittedly, the depth of these questions cannot or should not be handled in a sermon. Trying to do it is not fair. Jesus, though, is the one who opened this can of worms. And I can't just close it without saying a few more words. I do need to say, that the church needs to step up and help people as they go through divorce. And I, I own that myself. Too often we have been the ostrich with our head buried in the sand. Or, as I said, made sweeping pronouncements and created divisive rules that deepen the pain that is already present, which is how our passage deals with divorce today. I will say this to the United Church of Christ. I tip my hat because in 1995, our book of worship was the first book anywhere in the history of Christendom that offered a prayer and something of peace at the time of divorce. I don't know if you know that or not, but literally since 1995, the UCC has had a liturgy to be there for couples and families in this time. It's never helpful in some ways, but in the ways that it has been unhelpful, I'm sorry for your pain. And hear me when I add, and this is very important, that if through the experiences of marital struggle or divorce that you've gone through in my 25 years here, I have not been helpful to you, I apologize and ask your forgiveness. I really do. The reality of being torn asunder claims more room in our lives and in Judeo-Christian scriptures than can be captured in a brief reflection. As I have looked more closely at asunder, the word appears 22 times in the Bible, 13 in the Hebrew scriptures, nine in the Christian scriptures. And it's found in a combination which never turn out well. It means to break or to burst or to cleave or to depart or to cut, to divide or to drive apart or to pluck up, to rend, to saw. These are the translations that the Hebrew and Greek give us. It always relates to severing and almost always relates to harsh and violent separation. The truth is, in scripture and in life, for one person to be torn asunder always hurts everyone, as I said. And it hits everyone in spiritual, emotional, psychological, and sometimes physical ways that are not easy to mend and not easy to heal. The asundered can be seen in divorce, but let's be honest, our world, is filled with a sundering right now. 
It's not just in families. It's not just between couples. We see torn asunder stories everywhere that have nothing to do with divorce. We see torn asunder stories in war. And I'm looking at you, my friend, knowing that your family is in harm's way in Lebanon as war is coming into the country. Our prayers are with you. We're torn asunder by violent assaults, by neglect, and too many forms of abuse. None of us simply a walk away from asundered experiences without having been changed. I don't know about you, but I can't recall a time in my life as a citizen in our great nation when I have felt on a daily basis more tearing of the fabric of who we are and what we believe than I have in the past eight years. When it hits, it can be paralyzing. You might find yourself unable to move forward. You might be able to not be able to find unity or to heal as an individual and see the nation on full throttle social media-fied ways of amplifying divisions in a concentrated set of a few hands who seek to divide and separate for the dollar that they can make off of it. In spite of all of this, we are called to be different. We're called to move forward. We are called by Jesus and the values we hold in our sacred texts of scripture and our nation's central documents which set forth our binding values of unity not to divide. We're called to bridge differences and we're called not to tear asunder any more than those who have already been hurt. Civility cannot be a word we simply use in a past tense. Civility must guide each of our present steps into a brighter future. Perhaps there is no better place to bind the brokenness than in the final verses of Mark's passage, which come as a strange addition to this. Let's face it, Jesus and the disciples have gone into the house, they ask him some more questions about divorce, and it doesn't get better. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. One of the disciples answers, and they look at Jesus and they go, it's those kids. They're at the front door. They're coming to bug you again. And then disciples turn to the kids and go, get out of here. And Jesus says, you get out of here. They come in here. And Jesus welcomes the children. It's the children who show us the move from the tears of a sundering into the hope of a bright tomorrow and a bright today. After presenting all these hard texts, Jesus says, come on in, kids. He says to the disciples, you guys go to the edges here. They're coming to the center of the floor. And he gets down on the floor with them and he starts listening to them. They're telling him all the stories of their lives. They're telling him what they've learned from his teachings. And He's not there to teach them so much as there to teach him, and it ends up being a healing and a blessing for everyone involved. You see, Jesus knows that they just have heard some very hard words about divorce. He knows that the children always suffer the secondary effects of the pain of a sundering, so he wants to be with them now. The Lord of life, the Messiah of the world, sits down on the ground and hangs out with the kids. He blesses them and offers the best of who he is. While those who are asundered stand around, broken and forlorn, Jesus is with the children, showing them what it looks like to be humble, to get down on your knees and be caught up in meaningful no moments with little ones. It's a spirit of unity in the face of division. It's a spirit of binding that's bringing together broken relationships. It's a spirit of of changing the fissures of family and the world to bring everyone together. In this same spirit, we're called by Jesus to the table today, the table of grace on this 91st World Communion Sunday. You see, there wasn't always a World Communion Sunday. In 1933, while Hitler was beginning to rise in his dictatorial power in Germany, and the world was latching on to one dangerous dictator after another, and as the human family was struggling to get back on its feet from the malaise of the Great Depression, one man had a vision. His name was Dr. Hugh Thompson Kerr, senior minister of Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he called 
the Universal Church to come together each year on the first Sunday of October to join at Christ's table. Do you know how hard that was to do back then? They didn't have any social media. I know you might be surprised by that. But he literally wrote a letter to the world and said, let's get to the table together, right? He believed that the church should come to Christ's table and show unity in Christ. It was the gift that he gave. Thanks be to God for the Presbyterians, Reverend Miller, and for the gift that he gave all of us that day. It started slowly, but Dr. Kerr stuck with it. And during World War II, World Communion Sunday caught on. And you know who made it catch on? The soldiers on both sides of the war who believed that they could come to the table once in a year to be brothers at the table of grace. It was the troops who crossed enemy lines in Europe and embraced this symbol of unity in the midst of war. And that's why we have this today. We can never take this for granted. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are to discern the body when we partake in Holy Communion, mindful that we note our relationship to all in Christ's communion and celebration. In the asundering days in which we live, I pray that we will find a way of healing and wholeness. And may we become like little children and approach our Savior and his table with joy and delight. And may we, like Dr. Kerr, pray that this table becomes the place where the whole world comes for healing, that this table becomes the place where hope is born again. My sisters and brothers, we need to overcome and heal from any and all asundering in our lives. So let's begin now, right here at God's table of grace. Let's come to the table just as we are. Let's come open to healing. Let's come and receive love and grace right here, right now.